thank you very much, um, Andrew Magnus and Giovanna. Um, I, I wasn't too sure when I stood here this morning what the th three speakers, four speakers were going to talk about, but I'm very impressed by the variety of uh, topics that we've been uh, engaged with in the last uh, hour. So thank you very much, everybody. Um, I, I'm sure we must have quite a few questions. We'll start uh, with two or three questions from the floor, um, and we'll ask the speakers to respond to those first before we look at for the online questions, if there are any. Uh, thank you. Uh, H.N. Romsom um, and a GCC. I got a question for, for Magnus as you set it up already. So um, I've got a long background in uh, the oil and gas industry and, and actually 10 years ago I was looking at deep sea mining as, a, as an opportunity in a previous life. And, and a lot of technology is now available uh, through the subsea developments in oil and gas. I mean, oil and gas is going down to 3,000 meters depth, setting quite complex permanent infrastructure on the seabed for long-term operation of uh, oil and gas fields below the seabed. So technically, uh, there's been a lot of development to, to be able to do work at, at those sort of depths. However, in the oil and gas industry, uh, one should work on the premise that ultimately you need to know the impact of, of, of your activity, which means uh, environmental impact assessments and also when the work is done, a complete remediation of, of uh, the, um, the area where work was undertaken. Now, I'm, I'm very much aware that doesn't always happen, uh, but that's the, that's the standard. Now, for, for sea mining, and particularly the deep sea mining, there's so much still unknown about how the uh, deep sea actually interfaces with smaller seas, and, and new species are being discovered uh, quite regularly at these depths, and so we actually know very little um, of what, what goes on at, uh, in, in the deep sea. It's a very much unexplored area of our planet. So how, how do you see, then, how one should move forward evaluating this as an opportunity when, when there's a considerable risk that we don't know what we're doing when we start doing. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Ezra Madzwanika. I'm uh, working for African Tax Administration Forum as the research manager. Uh, firstly, I want to thank um, the presenters I think I was impressed with all the three presentations, um, and I, I really want to thank you for that. Uh, just a comment for uh, the presentation from uh, Steve. I think it resonates well with the work that we, as ETAF, have also done on the ex uh, extractives, and we have also developed a few ideas which I saw were quite linking with the, what you were suggesting. Perhaps just one question for Steve is um, where we mentioned about the involvement of the state in mining, what should the state bring into the game? I'm saying so because there are countries like here, I'm coming from Zimbabwe, we at one time introduced uh, what you call the indigenization regulations where we were saying for a company to come and invest, the nation should also get a stake of 51%. But we were not prepared to offer something, uh, but we're saying, the, the, so it was a difficult uh, thing for the, for the investors and uh, it created a lot of uh, tension until we sort of set aside that regulation. So what should the, the, the country um, also bring to the table where it is going to shape uh, profits? That's for Steve. And then um, I have a question for Giovanni. I think your presentation was very interesting. I really liked it. And it was also exposing the corruption that comes through um, uh, the different um, licenses or contracts that are offered in the, in the mining sector. My question to you is, um, we have seen, especially in Africa, where most of the contracts that have been uh, negotiated previously have been re-looked. Tanzania is one of the examples 
where actually there was a renegotiation of the existing contract because uh, the state realized that it has not been done well. So my question to you is, I think so many countries are facing that problems. We have already alluded to sometimes there is corruption involvement or politically connected people. So it means when the licenses are offered, is, they are not offered in a transparent way. And so it means if there is new government, there might be opportunity to renegotiate that. And do we have uh, that capacity, one, to renegotiate? And is it feasible? from the legal um, perspective to renegotiate existing contracts in the mining sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions from the floor? Yes, sir. Uh, um, from ET. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I, I also have a, a question for Dr. Mark Longo. Um, I, I really enjoyed the, the presentation. I was, I was, uh, I'm Esteban Manteca from the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative, and so we work a lot with that information as well. Um, and I, so two, two things. The first one, it was a little bit sad to see that you had to pay for data to do your research. Uh, I think that should not happen, and we're pushing for that to, to actually not happening anymore. Um, it'll be really interesting to see if future iterations of this paper um, can actually utilize data that has already been public in different countries that are implementing the EITI standard. Um, and in that, uh, I think one of the uh, most interesting projects we have had recently in Colombia, and now, just last week, uh, it was announced in, in Nigeria as well, um, we, were, we were launching a project called Joining the Dots, with the support of Directorio Legislativo, uh, uh, CSO in Argentina. Um, and what they did was, based on, on information on um, sworn declarations by public of, uh, officers, they took a list of all the different um, uh, extracted licenses that existed, and they highlighted some potential, potential uh, red flags in terms of politically exposed persons and uh, extractive uh, um, activities in, in, in Colombia. So I think mixing these two would be a fantastic next step because then you can see exactly whether these uh, um, offshores have also politically exposed persons and then that could strengthen the linkage. And on that note, I have just one question. How do you, um, is, is there any way to identify, for instance, the different sectors that these offshore companies are listed in? For, so for example, I'm thinking, yeah, there might be some financial uh, companies or there might just be others that are dedicated to different things. So um, yeah, thank you. You had, a, you had a question from Etienne. Yeah. Yes. Um, uh, I, somehow, Etienne, I think we have, uh, uh, the two uh, of us, a little different view on the technology necessary, but we can put that aside. I think it's a quite a different thing to, to do the oil extraction. But um, I think there are several uh, options here. I mean, uh, Norway is intending to, to start um, the, the operation on the uh, Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and the Norwegian um, authorities have asked for proposals how to do this and what will be the environmental effects and, and, and uh, so on. And uh, I, I think, I'm not quite sure, but I think that process is still underway uh, and that it, previously it was thought that that could be completed already this year and mining or <clears throat> uh, activities starting next year. but. So I, I don't think that will be the case. But I think that's, that's one way that various countries, and, and perhaps it is illustrative that the uh, Papua New Guinean, Guinean government, they were very excited about the opportunities in this Solvara project. And they actually invested, I think, I don't know, in the order of 50 to 100 million dollars, which were completely gone. and. and after that, there will be uh, no more deep seabed mining in PNG for a long period of time. But 
I hinted at the, the possibilities on, on for the international waters, and that is really to try to strengthen the, the role of the International Seabed Authority. If, if there is a moratorium uh, put in place, that will mean the stop of all and of all research on the environment. Be most, of, most of the research has been funded through the exploration uh, conditions that ISA has set up. So I think strengthening the International Seabed Authority and using that as uh, their research and, and, and the, the conditions to their uh, exploration licenses is, is a way forward. Uh, the, the, um, there are a couple of papers on this and they're cited actually in our report uh, that the, the, the dangers or the re effects of a moratorium will be Yes, more, it, it will be a complete stop also on the more um, general uh, research on biology and fauna and, and environmental effects. And I think that's a pity because in some instances it, it might be useful into the future considering the high demand for uh, some of these metals uh, in the green transition. But at the same time, I think it's important to understand that the the growth rate of copper demand and nickel demand that is projected by the International Energy Agency and others into the future, they use the absolute numbers, they are staggering, but they, the relative growth rates are not much higher than what the land-based industry has managed to supply in the past 20 years during the super cycle when demand increased quite rapidly. So um, from a demand point of view, I'm also a bit skeptical, but I think of course that there should be readiness so that, as I said, the International Seabed Authority is unique. It's a, no mining has started and the, uh, the, the regime is being discussed and debated. Our little group has done studies for the International Seabed Authority on what royalty rate should be for example, so th th that, that work on the regime and, and the environmental effects should continue until so that when uh, the, the extraction from the seabed is economically uh, feasible, the, all the regulations and, and dangers in the environmental side and for that matter also socio-economically uh, uh, are in place. Sorry, sorry to butt in, but uh, let's... Uh I'm conscious Sorry. of the time, so uh, let's <laughs> go to the second question, because this, uh, this was about from a gentleman from Zimbabwe, I think. Th thank you for that question. Actually, um, I have a very radical answer, uh, which I normally give. When you are negotiating with a foreign entity in terms of uh, joint ownership, the first position of the government should be that um, the reserves are ours. The investor will bring in the cash, the country will bring in the reserves. That's already a basis for 50% 50, 50 ownership. This is what Botswana did. When the bears went to Botswana to start mining, they, they said, you want a joint venture. They said, you, are, you have to pay for the shares. Botswana said, no, 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 no. The reserves are ours. So for, 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 for us, that constitutes the 50%. So, they, so that, 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 that's the beginning point. You know, the governments need tough negotiating teams. And if they, if they cannot manage to have tough, tough teams, they can get help from other sources. Of course, if you, if you want to be more uh, more lenient, more more, more economic, there, there, are, there are other methods. One of the methods we looked at was that you know, we could use a, a royalty, a royalty flow. I can't remember the word now, Steve. You know, the, the, this is where you, you agree to the ownership. But then the government says, look, I don't have cash. From my royalties, or from my, from my, from my um, 
my share of the profit, I'll be paying off, you know, for this uh, shareholding until it's, it's paid off. So between those, those approaches, I think we can achieve what we are, what, what we're looking at. I hope that Zimbabwe can, you know, <laughs> revert to this. I know there's so much mining coming up in Zimbabwe from Chinese and so forth because of the platinum. So I think this is a good approach. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that question and for all the other questions that have been brought up. Let me just um, uh, emphasize two things. One, of course, indirectly you're talking about private sector participation in, uh, in mining in uh, Zimbabwe. I've always been fascinated by this uh, tension between private sector development and what the countries really want. So I once wrote a small paper and said uh, private sector development, but who's private sector? So just imagine a scenario where you have Norway, which has a lot of money, but um, you have a private sector owned by Ugandans. Ugandans own everything in, uh, it's still the private sector, but people are going to be worried. So, you know, they'd be grumbling, well, maybe revolution even. Uh, so, so you need resource nationalism is going to be with you whether you want or not. And so part of the political economy is how to manage that resource nationalism. It could be by giving government 51% or whatever it is, but I think the trick is to do, find ways of doing it in a strategic manner, in an efficient manner. Uh, and there's a lot of grandstanding all over the place from the side of donors and so all the private sector must come in, but have to be very, very careful what kind of private sector you have. Let me just make one other point. The so-called KISS principle, which Andrew, <laughs> is, you know, so essentially, uh, so keep it simple. Some people say sir, others say stupid. Keep it simple, stupid. So it's too complicated. There are all sorts of things in this, but uh, let's try to keep it simple. And what does that mean, really? That uh, you are running these things to make a bit of profit. You're running mining. You don't want to destroy, essentially, the endowment. You're trying to uh, preserve some money for future generations. The issues are quite simple. So try to make it simple. The more complicated it becomes, the more difficult it is to actually get some benefit for the country out of it. Yeah. You pass over Thank to, uh, to Ivan. Yeah, several questions. Uh. Yeah, so thank you so much for the questions. And uh, I'm going to reply to your question on three points. So about renegotiation on contracts. So I think, again, the key is, uh, as we heard it this morning as well, is about transparency. So I think as long as the terms of the contracts are being published and available, then at that point, then it becomes that not only the government is going to be involved in the renegotiation, but also the citizens will have the ability to see what is happening. And therefore, at that moment, not only the multinational corporation, if that's the case, has to officially say what his standards are, but also the government has to respond to the citizens. Then the second one is coming from AT, actually. So AT is promoting initiatives that are on standardizing, for example, the ways that uh, the revenues uh, are accounted in the different uh, countries when like, these revenues are coming from the extractive resources. So I think uh, this is useful not only to have transparency again, but also to have comparisons. So once we know that the numbers that we're putting when we're counting, for example, revenues, are accounted in the same way in different years, then it's going to be easier to make a comparison across the years and also to learn from the past and see what are the terms that we're negotiating, how they compare to the different years. So I think like there's a point on uh, making the government and the uh, corporations accountable. And then there is a point on being able to look at the data over time in a way that uh, we can learn better how to uh, learn from uh, the numbers that uh, we have been publishing. And then the last point, I'm going to borrow it from yesterday keynote, and it's going to be about the trade-off between the short term and the long term. So sometimes corruption is coming because uh, uh, 
who's involved in it, in maybe the public figure that's involved in it, is uh, uh, giving more value to the short income that could be what ends up in his pocket or her pocket versus what the long term could be, what that money could be used to build, uh, uh, as it was said, like uh, schools, hospitals, and roads. But then, like, uh, at that point, I would say, why not making the uh, renegotiation or the contracts conditional on these long-term outcomes? So it's, it's being like, okay, together with these terms of the contract, it's going to come that how many jobs are you going to create? And so at that point, you not only have something that is a long-term outcome, you also have something that you can measure. And maybe because I'm an economist by training, but I do like to have... Uh, uh, things that can be measured in an easy way to know whether like uh, I've reached the goals or to at least evaluate the impact. And uh, to uh, the 80, and so thank you so much for the ideas, Daphne, and I look forward to the Joining the Dots project. And the reason why uh, we had to purchase the data, unfortunately, was because we were looking at uh, an analysis that was uh, cross-country. And that was actually, again, like standardized, like the data was reported in a similar way across different countries. But uh, we would love to have a publicly available database on licensing, also not only, for example, on oil, but also on minerals and mining. And then about like uh, your idea, it's definitely like something we should uh, look more in detail and looking like joining again, like what are the companies they are linked to perhaps. So the tricky part is that, for example, when we look at the Panama Papers, sometimes like we can link the country of the beneficiary, but oftentimes it's not the uh, person that is like, uh, for example, a ministry or a public figure, maybe it's not going to put his name, and so it's going to be tricky, but it's definitely something to look more into. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we, we have one, I think we have one online question, so Magnus, bear with me, we'll have the one line, online question, and I think you have a question as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, from the online, from Nana Kwaison, the question is, where the sector becomes more competitive and there are more countries or organizations seeking to explore the international seabed for minerals, how might the allocation of rights or permissions to explore these resources have to change? Thank you. That's it. That would be a question then. Thank you very much uh, on, online for that question. I have to disappoint you. I, uh, I don't have much of an idea how to do that. Uh, um, I, it's true that the present system is fairly complicated with uh, you have to have a sponsoring state that supports the various companies that do apply for exploration licenses. And uh, no, I, I'm, I'm sorry that it's a question that I, I don't have any good answers to. Uh, the, the one of the, if I may say so, problems with the United Nations uh, Convention uh, Law of the Sea is that United States hasn't signed it. They decide to not sign it uh, before it was even uh, completed. Uh, so. Um, that's the reason why some companies then from the United States can uh, circumvent some of the problems. But um, I'm sorry, I have to disappoint you there. <laughs> Just check. We have no more questions online. No. Okay. So, are there any more questions from the floor? If so, yes. Thank you, Lord Sekman Norad. Uh, it's more kind of a reflection and I uh, would like to solicit your reflections on it. And um, these days um, there is a rapid evolution and uh, growth of uh, carbon offset markets. And uh, there is a, a keen interest in many African countries to benefit from this market. Uh, there are various issues. Uh, I think the growth is very much related to uh, many companies now trying to become net zero in terms of uh, emissions. So there are kind of business opportunities. And I wonder if you have any kind of reflections on possible, uh, so to speak, uh, experiences, lessons learned from the mineral sector that might be uh, useful when uh, African governments start to 
regulate and uh, benefit from this. Uh, there are challenges with uh, integrity. There has been talk about the need to have jurisdictional approaches, uh, not only to have project by product approaches. There are of course issues because land is involved, how is benefits to be shared between government uh, concerned uh, people living in these areas. So there are some, I can see some parallels to the mineral sector, so, but of course well, it's you're, different you're also. taking us uh, somewhat beyond the scope of the three papers. I wonder if uh, Steve perhaps would like to... Could, yes, like could I just say one or two words and then Andrew could round it off? You see, what I sort of said is that uh, there are a whole lot of incredibly good ideas out there in the marketplace. Uh, carbon uh, sort of capture, uh, of course, essentially planting trees in various places. But uh, you see, if it's not driven by governments themselves, if it's companies coming in, for instance, a lot of companies have come in and have introduced rapidly growing trees. I, I, I forget the species. But those might not be necessarily the stuff you need. They're not indigenous in a way. They find trees that sprouts in 25 years, but come in with all sorts of problems, diseases, and so on and so forth. So there's that problem. Everybody is very anxious to come in. The governments are very busy fighting uh, jihadists and, uh, and all those kind of problems. I might not be quite focused on these issues. So the agenda is completely uh, overwhelming sometimes. So I don't quite know which way one could. I mean, maybe these are part of the, the donor community could come in and give a lot of these countries a soft landing. While they might be uh, uh, sort of diverted by other social issues on the ground that have become too complicated, that, that actually uh, the donor community, why there is self and so on, which is already, this is what it's doing, find uh, some kind of common ground does on which it, to pursue. Does it need legislation? Uh, I mean, the thing wants to be left the market to begin, and we're getting these offset trades already, are we not? Uh, companies, multinationals are trying to um, deal with their scope three emissions, are doing offsets. So let them fight it out on the... Yeah, I kind of understand. Yeah, I quite. Yeah, you're saying, <coughs> you're saying markets will eventually find a solution. I don't know. Well, yeah, no, no, I, it, very interesting. But if you're saying that the institution institutions are not working at the moment mm. because of X, Y, Z mm. reasons, definitely your markets are not going to work in Niger and Mali mm. and Gabon now because of political reasons. Sure. Okay. So the, the situation on the ground is a little more complicated than we think. Thank you. Well, um, are there more questions from the floor, please, sir? Magnus, Just, Magnus sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Just to add that, uh, you know, this issue of uh, carbon credits offsets is gathering momentum. I, I know that in Zambia they are trying to build some capacity through the Ministry of um, Environment and Green Economy. The, the, the focus initially is on the forested areas, you know, how, how we can do that. But I think the, the idea of extending it to mining would be also a very, a very, very interesting uh, prospect. I think, I think that should also come up with, for countries like Zambia, which are very mining, the um, regulation is also getting stronger. You know, I don't, I don't know whether you, you heard that the, the, the government in 2021 gave a mining license to, to a concession to start mining in the lower Zambezi. The, the lower Zambezi is close to the border of Zimbabwe, close to the force, close to the, the game parks. So these guys were almost mobilizing to start mining. And then the new government, uh, using the environmental authority recommendations, has, has, has put a stop to, to, to that project. I think, I think that's, that's one way that governments, you know, by strengthening regulation, can bring into this uh, offset of credits, no, not only in forestry, but also in mining. You have a question for... Uh, uh, it's a question for, uh, for Steve and, and Andrew here. Um, <clears throat> in the 60s, Zambia nationalized its mining companies. And so my question is, what lessons have been learned from that 
very quickly. So in order to make the, the present idea of buying 50% more uh, feasible and, and to work in the proper way. I'm all for it. The, the government moved to take stake in the mines. What, what they did at that time was that they acquired 51% of the assets which were then controlled by uh, Anglo-American and the RST. Um, the, the, the move itself was very much commercial. What, what um, KK did, of course, Kenneth Kaunda, they, they agreed that um, we don't have the cash, but we are going to use stream royalties you know, to, to pay for our share of the capital you know, by apportioning a certain amount, you know, maybe 2% or whatever, every year, until the capital is fully paid up. The companies were very happy with that, you know, and the, 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 the things are working. That was 1969. But um, the, the, the big lesson which came up was that uh, in, um, in 1972, uh, KK, you know, very proactive, uh, the president. In 1972, KK got impatient. He said, no. This, this arrangement of buying shares slowly, I mean, paying slowly, is not working for us. So he moved to, to, to pay in full for the shares, which they could have paid for over maybe 20 years. And they went to the World Bank, borrowed money, and paid off the mines. I think that, 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 that was, um, that, that was uh, the biggest mistake they made. Otherwise, the idea of um, acquiring through gradual payments was genius. So, so I think for me that, that, that's a lesson that can be taken up, you know, in looking at the, at, at the future. Okay. Yeah, you know. So it's, it's, it's something that can be looked at. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. I think um, we've come to the end of our time. Um, I think we've had three very interesting uh, presentations and some good questions on the floor. So may I ask you to thank you, thank the panelists uh, for their contributions and thank yourselves for your very good questions. Thank you very much.